Hello, welcome to Unity On Demand. We are uh, in the fifth week of our six week series on embracing uncertainty. We're brought to you this morning by the coronavirus, otherwise we would also be meeting in person. This has been quite a week for all of us all across our country, starting out in Minneapolis, um, right through to all the cities uh, you know, around our country uh, with the protest about the violence against African-Americans. I was so impressed that the reports that came out of Detroit explained that the nine people arrested, seven of those didn't even live in Detroit. There are groups of instigators that get involved with the protest and turn them into riots for their own advantage through looting and, and chaos and mayhem. There is a real legitimate reason for the protests that our fellow citizens, our, our, our fellow people here in this country are being treated so unfairly. And um, yeah, it's just, it's heart, ups heart upsetting to me. And I know it may be for you too. So this morning I would just like us to get centered. Uh, I'm gonna start a saw that we often use to close our service and today we'll use it to open us, to get us into that space of, of peace and love and connectedness one with another. our choice today. I had originally planned to begin this talk with a quote from a Tibetan Buddhist master. And when I chose it, it meant a lot different than what it sounds like today in light of pleasant circum present circumstances. He said, look, this is your world. You can't not look. There is no other world. This is your world. It is your feast. You inherited this. You inherited these eyeballs. You inherited the whole world of color. Look at the greatness of the whole thing. Look, don't hesitate. Look, open your eyes, don't blink. And look, look, look further. Wow, look further. A couple weeks ago, uh, I encourage you to Collect heroes, people that inspired you because of their work or their writing, somehow they touched your heart. And I happen to find two new heroes I'd like to add to my list this week. One is a heavyweight boxer, Joe Lewis, and the other is his German counterpart, Matt Part, Max Schmeling. Uh, these two were scheduled to uh, fight the fight of the century in 1936, June 19th. And this was quite a story. Uh, the fight went on and on. It was in the 12th inning, finally, that Max Schmeling, German, um, put down Joe Lewis, had uh, just, uh, who it seemed invincible up to that point. In fact, the odds against Max winning were 10 to 1. Well, this win of a white man over an African American, it was hailed by Rudolf Hitler as an example of racial superiority and Aryan's um, dominance. Yeah. This sport was made into, into a race war. But Max was not a Nazi. And even though his winning this thing gave him access to really the high life in Germany, meeting people like Marlene Dietrich and, and just carousing and going to the best restaurants and everything, he did not adhere to Adolf Hitler's um, whole theory of, of the Aryan race. And this was put into practice a few years later, what during what was called the Crystal Night, the Crystal Night, the night of, of breaking glass. This was when the Nazis went out and attacked 
all the Jewish businesses. They broke windows, there was violence, uh, they burned places down, people were hurt, people were murdered. And during that night, Max went and rescued some of the people that he knew that were Jewish in his apartment, risking his own life, because if he had been caught, he certainly would have been punished for that. So he was a great boxer, but he was also a great man. And his statue was up there until in 38, uh, he lost his next fight to Joe Lewis. Lewis, Joe won, and he kind of, you know, melted back into the background, if you will. But it was just such a, a wonderful story of how appearances can seem one way, and the truth of the situation can be quite a different situation, if you will. Oh, stop sharing here. We'll go to that later. Uh, so, times are always changing, and, and during changing societal times, during even crises in our own life, or those challenge points in our own life, and we see that things are going to take a, a different direction, uh, we have this sense sometimes to fear the change, because the change is certain, but what we're changing into is unknown, and that's what, you know, what can make us fearful. But if you think about it, an idea that there's some kind of a permanent solution, a permanent destination, that once we get there, our work is done and we can just rest and, and lollygag, uh, rest on our laurels for the rest of our life, it's really an illusion. It never happens that way. And, you know, and in truth, our happiness is not a stagnant place. Our happiness is something that is always evolving and changing. What made us happy at two doesn't make us happy at 12 or 22 or 52, or whatever age you might be. So the more that we can learn to embrace uncertainty, the happier we will be, the more we will stand in the flow of life instead of trying to fight that current, and the more we will be able to grow and evolve and, and strengthen ourselves. I go back to what the Tibetan monk wrote, look, look, look further. And as we look further, the key is that we get to choose the direction in which we look. Dale Carnegie wrote a, a little poem you may have heard about two men look out from bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. We all look out and we get to choose which direction we're looking in. And when we look further, it's not about looking back. It's about looking at the now and really being present and seeing what we can evolve out of it, what we can love into it, what we can expand to a greater good. During this pandemic, we're now into the third month of, of a lot of isolation and quarantining. And there comes to an awareness that there have been a lot of gifts in this pandemic. Certainly we've learned to be, to rest in the quiet, to take things a little more peaceful. But one of the other gifts I noticed was it shone a light on some societal ills. And certainly the racism that is still existent in our system, it's systematic. When it showed up that um, African-Americans were disproportionately more likely to get the coronavirus, that the economic factors um, that just meant that non-whites, um, non people of color, more like, were more likely to be doing essential service jobs that we needed to be kept done and therefore, they were more exposed to the virus. Also, they did not have the same access to healthcare that white people might have. And boy, you know, for me, that was shocking to hear those kind of statistics. I really thought after the civil rights movement of the 60s that we made some inching forward. And I have no idea what it's like to live with a skin other than the skin I've been given. I have no idea what it's like to have to tell my child to be careful if they run down the street at night not to wear a hoodie, or they go into a store, how to react, or if a police stops them driving, what they should do. And during this pandemic, we really get the sense that the whole economic world is, is about ready to change. I mean, it has changed for this, and it's not going to go back to the way it was. It's not going to the old normal. There's going to be a new normal evolving. And I really have to sit with that question about what can we do to make it a more encompassing, a more even playing field for all people, no matter what their background, what their skin color, what their nationality, uh, just to, to really have an economic um, policy and culture and consciousness of oneness, that we all have this equal opportunity, that we have equal support and most of all, equal safety in our own country. You know, the mind can get filled with all these ideas and, and worries about all these different things. 
And sometimes we talk about the monkey mind when we're trying to meditate, trying to still our mind so that we can get that um, guidance for the next step. Well, in Hindu, they don't stop with just the monkey mind. They call it the drunken monkey mind, because not only is it very busy going all over, but it's kind of sloppy in its whole way of thinking. And, you know, part of that, I think, is because when we're totally in our mind, we get disconnected from our heart. And that's where things kind of go on the wayside. So unlike Socrates, who said, I think, therefore I am, I kind of like Winnie the Pooh, who said, I think. Therefore, I am confused because it is very confusing when we just wander in all these thoughts. We need to be able to find a way to empty our mind. There's a, a story told of the Zen master, a student comes to him and the Zen master offers him a cup of tea and the master begins pouring the tea as the student talks to him and tells him all the things he knows. He's going on and on and the student looks down and realizes that the teacup is overflowing. And he says to the master, stop, stop, the cup is full, it can't take anymore. And the master says to the student, so is your mind, it's so full, you're not ready to learn anything else. So we, you know, might aspire to find ways to be the empty cup that can be filled, was filled with something new, new ideas, ideas that are, are more loving, more connecting, um, just more compassionate in all the things that we do. So the question I have for you today, go back to the screen sharing here. Are you ready for a black belt? <clears throat> so this is a line from a parable. It's about a martial artist who kneels before Master Sensei in ceremony, about to receive the hard-earned black belt. After years of relentless training, the student was just so excited to get this, this earmark of, of achievement. And the sensei says to him, you have one more thing to do to get the black belt. And the student's thinking there's going to be some kind of a demonstration that he's going to need to do, some kind of uh, movements or whatever. And the sensei says to him, why, what does the black belt, what does the black belt mean to you? And the student goes, thinking, this is easy. The student says, it means it's a well-deserved reward for my hard work. The sensei says, nothing. And then he said, no, you're not ready. I want you to go home for a, for a year, do your exercise, practice, come back to me next year, and we'll see if you're ready for your black belt. So the student comes back a year later. He's feeling like he's grown. He's done what he needs to do. And he gets the question, what is the meaning of the black belt? And the student says, why, it's a symbol of distinction of the highest achievement in our art. Hmm, because it's not say, you're still not ready. I want you to go home yet again for another year and come back to me at that time and we'll see if you're ready for your black belt. A year later, the student kneels before the sensei. What is the true meaning of the black belt? And this time the student answers. The black belt represents not the end, but the beginning, the start of a never ending journey of discipline, work in the pursuit of an ever higher standard. The pursuit of an ever higher standard. It wasn't the end, it was the beginning of the next step. So how do we embrace a higher standard? Well, certainly, Part of it is our relationship with God, with spirit. So I have a couple questions for you this morning. Are you ready for your black belt? Do you believe in God? You're probably going, well, sure, and of course, of course I do. That's why I come to church and participate and go to classes and all that. Okay, so you believe in God. But here's the hard question. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? How many times do we take it in prayer and then immediately take our problems back because we're going to do it ourselves? We know the right answer. We know how we want it done. How many of us believe in God but really don't trust that presence of divine love to be the overpowering movement in whatever is happening in our world? And it's not surprising. Many of us have been wounded over the years by church experiences. Um, yeah, I, I'm not even going to get into all the different details of, of how people have been wounded, 
but they really connected that church wounding, that wounding of religion with God itself. So there's a little bit of a trust factor issue. And how about the idea of the Bible? Many people have been beaten over the head, literally and uh, literally, uh, with the Bible. The stories in the Bible, the people that wrote them, they were all human, and they all felt that they were divinely inspired, and they each had their own personal prejudices. The role of women, the, the role of, of worship, the role of forgiveness, the role of uh, how we treat our enemies. Each person that wrote for that book that we use as an inspiration had their own prejudice. So it's not to be taken literal. It's meant to be taken in a way that we question and that we're inspired and that we look further, really, to write our, to create our own book, our own holy inspiration. So I think for me going forward, it's learning, it's not about trusting whatever might be defined as God in my mind, but to know that if it's not about love, it isn't about God. If it's not about love, it's not about God. We need to learn to embrace what we trust. We trust love. And that's where we're going to find that ever higher standard. That's where we're gonna to learn to look, to find that higher standard that will not only improve our own life and well-being, mental and physical well-being, but that of our whole human race. I did wanna finish off the story of, of Charles and Joe um, because it didn't stop. Uh, there we go. It didn't stop there over in Germany in 19, 80. This is 44 years after their first big fight. There was a tribute to Joe Lewis. Now, I will tell you this time he was in a wheelchair and dementia was, was had pretty well taken over all of his mind and his thinking. Now, I'll shrink my picture here so you can see. Here is Max Schmeling and here is Joe Lewis. And this man in the middle owns the Sands Hotel where the tribute was held. And his name is Henry Lewin. And as he got up on stage introducing these championship heavyweight fighters, and he gets to Max Schmeling and he, he tears up. And he says, if it wasn't for this man, I wouldn't be here tonight and neither would he. Because during that night of the broken glass, that night that the Nazis burned the businesses, had this huge riot and, and killed and maimed people and, and took people into concentration camps, Max had taken Henry and his family and kept them safe in his apartment. An amazing, amazing thing to do. And then he helped them get to safety. So here he was years later being able to thank him for doing what he did. And Max and Joe uh, Lewis, just they enjoyed a friendship all their life in spite of their differences. And a friend of Max's once said about Joe Lewis, he said, he was a credit to his race, the human race. And the same, same thing could be said about Max Schmeling. He was a credit to his race, the human race. And that is the higher standard that we're reaching for. I recently came across this cartoon this week. It's a policeman talking to a little African-American boy and the policeman says to him, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And the little boy is thinking, alive. What a sad state of affairs for children to worry about their safety in the United States of America for growing up. So there are a lot of things to worry about these days. I would just say, let's let God worry about it so we can be the higher standard. Let the worries go into the ethers, into that divine love to let us be lifted up in our thinking and our actions to be that higher state of humanity. I love this little thing down here, this blue in the uh, side in the corner. When I can't, God can. When I can't, God can. So this week, let us pray. Let us listen. But most of all, let us love into that higher standard. So spiritual practice, I encourage us to figure out how to become the empty cup. Ram Dass says, the quieter you are, the more you can hear. So let's increase our listening by being that quiet, quiet voice inside of us. We can hear the still small voice of God itself. 
to tie, the, tie up all the ideas of the day, I want to share a song by Daniel Navid and Patel, We Shall Overcome. It so speaks to the conditions of today. It's burning inside the hurting and the suffering minds, creating anger, fear, and pain, suffocating our times. The tougher it gets, the rougher social media cries. So we see to it that we tweet in only negative lines. We're sick and tired of history, but repeating it twice. Greed, anger, and violence clearly stealing our nights. Feeling it tight between the shoulders with a chill in the spine. Pinching myself, waking up, trying to stop the rewind and move forward towards stories overcoming our fears. Choosing love over hate, praying, trading hugs over tears. There's only one choice breaking down the walls and repair every broken heart on this planet till there's no longer fear walls can't hold us in fear can't keep us down love will rise again yeah it's rising right now we shall overcome every time i think it's gonna take much longer we getting stronger we have just begun gonna make a change we gotta push much farther we shall overcome we shall overcome we shall overcome Whoa. we shall overcome we shall overcome deal with himself when he was thrown off the train and the pain that he felt mrs parks disrespected dragged into jail because of the color of his skin organs tissues and cells one day a young girl was shot on a bus by a man a terrorist part of the taliban he said on this land you have no right to stand for what you believe in girls have no chance here well now that's just the story of three souls who shook our planet after being down on their knees and it's not gonna stop those seeds have now become trees and us human beings will keep on digging till we find Peace. Yeah, the cynics always say that nothing ever changes. The human nature's bound to stay the same. But it couldn't be more plain The violence never pains. Injustice never stays. Injustice never it's stays. bound to fade away. Stop only growing on demand for all being 
hands to feel peace in every heart and land. Thank you, Lord, for the strength and the courage to bring us together and keep our souls nourished. These tough times will only drown in our chorus, because we all believe that the truth is before us. We shall overcome this pain. We shall overcome this day. We pray for love to lead the way. a time that we celebrate our prosperity and I tell you I my heart is so full by the support that, that you give us here at Unity Spiritual Center of Lansing so if you donate online through our website some people send in checks um, to our office and of course part of the gifts that come in here we share with this quarter with the Haven House uh, the helping Lansing area families that are in need at this time so each of us in our own way have been blessed with the prosperity maybe different for each of us it's that thing that just just is a blessing so this is a time that we really take into our hearts a deep sense of gratitude for the gifts we received this week this month the unexpected phone call the smile of somebody who all all of a sudden mowed our lawn or brought us groceries um, financial gifts that have flowed into us from whatever different channels they may have arrived, knowing that we're loved by friends and family. We take all those blessings into our heart and bless them together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give and all that I receive. I praise, give thanks, and am glad. Well, Unity is on demand, and there's three parts to this, um, this message. Uh, the opening, God is with Winnelly, and there is a meditation uh, that is about being the light, bringing in the light to create some more peace and connectedness. So I hope that you will binge watch us. God bless, and have a great week.
Choose. 